Thanks for joining us at Dream City Online. Stay connected by downloading the Dream City Omaha app. And don't forget to subscribe for all our latest videos. Hey guys, welcome back to Emotional Intelligence. Hopefully you've been practicing those strategies for social awareness that we unpacked last week and you're already starting to see the implications of what it means to be able to really see the people around you. See them in a way that we're not looking through a jaded lens of our own lack of awareness. We're not looking through our own pain, but because we've done the work of self-awareness and self-management, now as we approach these skills, skills and the social competencies, that first one of social awareness, we're able to do this in a way that brings with it integrity of knowing that I have, I've put in the effort to grow in these areas personally so that I can now grow in them as it pertains to the people in my life. Now this week we're going to transition into our fourth and final skill of emotional intelligence. And this is the skill of relationship management. For many of you, you're like, yes, this is the week that I've been waiting for, Angel. Teach me how to deal with all the crazy, unhealthy, dysfunctional people in my life. And if that's your posture, if that's your response, my response to you would be, I already did. I taught you how to deal with them as I taught you really how to manage yourself. And so when we start to unpack what this looks like in our relationships, it's so important that we approach this skill of relationship management with the conviction necessary to proceed with grace and humility. And again, I cannot overemphasize the fact that we can do that because of the work that we've already put in. We are going to learn to effectively manage every single relationship in our life. From the ones that are the closest to us, these are the people that live in our homes, to the ones that maybe are limited to a single interaction. Every single one of these exchanges or these relationships in our life can be learned, uh, we can learn rather, to effectively manage in a way that's healthy and sustainable. But let's start with identifying or defining what relationship management is. As it pertains to emotional intelligence. Relationship management is defined as the ability to use your awareness of your own emotions and those of others to manage your interactions successfully. Okay, so I'm gonna take my awareness of my own emotions, this new social awareness of the emotions of the people around me, and I am going to manage any time those worlds collide successfully. As we circle back around, though, to this word management, it would probably benefit us to review what we learned about management from our time of studying that skill of self-management. If when I said, you're going to learn to effectively manage your relationships in your life, uh, maybe you, again, were tempted to roll your eyes as you thought to yourself, Angel, you don't know the people in my life. Let's take a refresher on what it means to manage because remember when we talked about self-management, there are uh, some unhealthy or some ineffective ways that we tend to view that word, right? We talked about denial, we talked about control, and we talked about suppression. And, and if when you hear relationship management, you think that this is, um, and maybe it's not even your heart in how you want to manage other people, but maybe you've been on the receiving end of some unhealthy relationship management, and it's looked more like, um, you know, someone trying to dominate you or master you or change you. Listen, let me just say it clearly that those are not healthy or effective ways to manage our relationships. And so that's not what we're going to be talking about. And so to be sure that we don't get caught in those familiar traps, let's, let's personify what those things look like when it comes to our relationships. So let's start with denial. If we understand and recognize already that denial is an ineffective, unhealthy way of managing, how will I recognize that in my relationships? 
In our relationships, denial is characterized by avoidance, okay? And it's not limited to just avoiding hard conversations or conflict. Within the context of our relationships, um, this avoidance can really be anything under the surface. And so relationships that are managed with a, a denial type of management tend to be very shallow and surface level relationships. The, the relationship can never actualize to its full potential because we avoid um, anything that requires a deeper level of intimacy. Oftentimes, the reason that these relationships do work, because immediately it's like, well, then why would we stay in those relationships? You'd be surprised. And as we go through these unhealthy forms of management, you're going to begin to realize that these are actually at play in more of your relationships than you realize. But when it comes to denial or avoidance, oftentimes these relationships are sustained through commonalities. There's a common goal or something that we are working towards a shared shared responsibility within the relationship. Um, this could be something as shallow as, you know, somebody that you greet with at church, right? You, you have a relationship because we're both greeters, but maybe we don't ever talk about our personal lives, our families. We certainly don't share one another's burden. But again, this is an example of, of shared responsibilities, of common goal. This could be a, as as distant or, or as... Um, of a fringe relationship is that to as close as the person that you share children with. And this is your textbook couple who 25, 30 years into marriage, the kids are grown and gone. They're sitting in my office and I hear one of those uh, common, well, we just grew apart. Well, the reality of it is, is you never purposed to grow together. You just shared a common responsibility of raising your children. Now again, we've all heard this. We've all walked with people who, who say things like this. In relationships, denial can be a protective measure against rejection or failure, right? It carries with it this idea, why rock the boat? You know, don't mess up a good thing. The idea is that things are just fine the way that they are. And in, oftentimes there's this this subconscious threat that if we go deeper and maybe one of us doesn't like what we find, it's going to end in, in rejection. Or maybe if we purpose to grow together and we fail, now we've just messed up a good thing. No, you're just settling. That's really what's happening here. And so it feels like it can be this protective measure against these things, but a lot of times, it's just the byproduct of plain old ignorance. People just don't know what they don't know. I, I can't tell you how many times, again, over the years, I've had couples in counseling where conflict was never healthy conflict resolution. Conflict was modeled, but healthy conflict resolution was never modeled. But not only that, there was no cultivation of outward intimacy. And I'm not talking, you know, oh, we didn't make out in front of our kids. I'm talking about the fact that when, when we grow up in a home where hard conversations are never facilitated, and then we just thrust children into the world like a swat on the butt, you got this champ, you really don't got this. Because within the walls of your home is where those hard conversations are supposed to be taking place. We can't rely on social media or the school or even your local youth group to have hard conversations. It's in the, these family settings where we're supposed to be learned and trained in cultivating a deeper less than surface level relationship. This is where we go into some of those more vulnerable topics. And so again, what we think is common sense, well, what do you mean your parents didn't talk to you? And you guys talk to you about anything from finances to sex and everything in between. Because we've got people that grow up and they don't even know how to talk about money issues. And this feels like something so vulnerable, again, because of plain old Ignorance. So much of this goes back to our family of origin. 
in depending on how relationships were modeled in your life, what roles they played, what relational needs you are or were aware of, how you've been taught to, to deal with those needs will massively influence not only your ability, but your willingness and even your desire to, to dive deeper into the throes of relational intimacy. So again, as a form of relationship management, denial really can be characterized by avoidance. Then we're gonna look at control, okay? Control as it pertains to relationships is the same manifestation of fear as it is in our, our self-management, right? I told you when we learned about self-management that control is a manifestation of pride that is rooted in fear. When it comes to our relationships, those fears can be as broad and as diverse as the relationship itself, right? Because we don't just try to control the person that we're sleeping next to at night. When control is your go-to for relationship management, you would love to control every relationship in your life, from the people that you work with to the, the kids that are the parents, the kids, the, the coaches that your kids are playing sports with, um, the people in the grocery store, I mean, literally, this will flood into every relationship that you have. And so again, the fears can be as diverse and as broad as the relationship itself. But some common fears that we tend to have to deal with when it comes to our relationships are things like a fear of rejection, fear of failure, uh, a fear of being hurt, or, or even just being let down. So often we put so much emphasis on on the pressure in relationships and them meeting all of our needs or meeting none of our needs. Maybe I don't trust you with any of my needs because then you could disappoint me and somehow that would be the, the end all be all for this relationship. There's the fear of letting go or moving on. Even when you know that that's what needs to happen, oftentimes we resist that fear of change fear of inadequacy. This is not an exhaustive list, but again, these are some very common fears that we tend to see play themselves out a lot of times in our relationships, particularly fears that we're trying to avoid through the manifestation of control. Control, once again, is a counterfeit form of security. So in our minds, it's going to protect us from any one of those fears or a number of ones I did not mention from becoming a reality. Fear or control can be very overt in its expression. Things like physical or emotional abuse, threatening, badgering, pressuring, demeaning, um, isolation, all of these are forms of control that are, are usually pretty easy to pick up on, right? I worked with a young girl once Gosh, you guys, she was probably in her early to mid-20s, and she had just gotten out of a relationship with a man who l quite literally controlled every aspect of her life. She didn't have a car, so he had to drive her everywhere. She wasn't allowed to go to the grocery store without him. He would drive her to work. Sometimes he would pick her up from work. Sometimes he would show up at her work and just sit there like a creeper just to watch her. He controlled all their money. He controlled sex. He controlled what they would watch on TV. He controlled her social interaction, even her time with her family. She would have to ask permission to even spend time with her family, and a lot of times that would result in a fight before or after. Obviously that, for us, we hear this. If you ever watched a Lifetime movie, you're watching that thinking, oh my gosh, this is wildly dysfunctional. The irony of control in relationships is that most time people in these relationships don't realize that they're being controlled until they're removed from the environment. Remember, control is a counterfeit form of security. And so a lot of times, um, even though it's unhealthy, the control, the expression of control, gives off this, this pseudo or this faux feeling of being safe. And it takes being removed from that to recognize how unhealthy that this really is. 
Uh, other times the manifestation of control in a relationship can be less obvious. Control can be expressed in more subtle ways. Things like manipulation, um, guilt trips, blame shifting, gaslighting, coercion, bribery, um, even, you know, the, the really lavish gifts and the love bombing, okay? Love bombing is another form of control. It's one of those terms you hear thrown around a lot. Again, these things as well, and probably even more so, can go unnoticed, undetected for years. What you need to understand about control is that while it feels deeply personal, and listen, I grew up in a home where my mom was constantly in relationships with men who were physically, emotionally, mentally, like check all the boxes and the abuse of every kind was present in our lives. I have a gift and I know this and I know it's from the Lord, but people just make sense to me. And I remember you guys as like a nine and 10 year old little girl, like, being able to almost disassociate from my environment and understand why these men were beating my mom up, right? I'm like, oh, you have, you know, whatever it was. And I, I'm not even going to throw things out there because I do not want you for a single second to think that I'm excusing this type of behavior. I'm not. There's no excuse for these things. But again, while these, these patterns of behavior feel personal, especially when you're on the receiving end, they're not personal. Because control, like so many of our other defense mechanisms, these are just, these are coping skills of self-preservation. They're executed from a place of deficiency. What does that mean? It simply means I'm trying to get my needs met. Now again, emphatically, let me state, this in no way excuses controlling or abusive behavior, but the reason that I'm pointing out these, these unhealthy patterns of management is because it's not until we can recognize them, both in our own lives and in the lives of those that we're in relationships with, that we can frame the way that we're going to approach healthy relationship management moving forward. Because without an awareness of these things, and not just why they exist, but or that they exist, but why they exist, we will not um, be positioned in a healthy enough way to move forward with the type of relationship management that we really want to operate in. So it's not an excuse, but again, I wanna frame how we're thinking a little bit differently. So we've talked about denial, we've talked about control, we're gonna talk a little bit about suppression in relationships, because remember, those are those three wildly ineffective forms of management that we tend to target. So in our relationships, once again, denial and control come together to form this wildly dysfunctional pattern of suppression. And suppression in our relationship is characterized not only by the avoidance and the manipulation, but it's kind of magnified or exacerbated is probably a better word with distraction and coping, okay? As it pertains to our relationships, the avoidance of the issues is rarely because we don't know that they exist, but either one, we feel ill-equipped to deal with them, or two, we just refuse to take responsibility for our role in the relationship. I will tell you, in the 20 years of clinical experience that I have, whether I'm sitting with an individual or with a couple or with a family, I cannot think of a single time where there wasn't at least one thing that every person needed to take responsibility for. One of the, the greatest, I don't even know if I would call it a, a deception, but it's, it's really this this movement that I've seen uh, of this victim mentality. And listen, a lot of times it starts out with just this desire to feel seen in your pain. And that's real and that's necessary. That's why, you know, therapy can be so good, reading, podcasts, all of this. Why? Because these things put language 
to our pain. That's a necessary part of the journey to healing, but you can't stay there. And this idea of remaining in this victim mentality where I, there is absolutely nothing for me to take responsibility for. This is all because everyone else has hurt me. And, and again, it just perpetuates me being kicked while I'm down over and over. Listen, the world can do a really, really good job at seeing you, but they cannot heal you. So yes, do the work necessary to put the language to that, but then don't be afraid to take responsibility for where you need to grow. And no, I'm not saying you need to take responsibility for why you were being abused. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But listen, sometimes I need to take responsibility for the fact that I did not set a boundary. Maybe I need to take responsibility for the fact that I'm giving uh, unlimited access to the sacred places of my heart to people who have not proven that they can be responsible with those areas of my heart. But we've got to learn to be able to take responsibility for our roles in our relational issues. When John and I got married, man, we showed up on the doorstep with a load of baggage, and I'm not talking about clothes and baseball caps. There was so much emotional and relational baggage, and we both excelled in spotting that in the other person, right? It was not hard for me to be able to let John know what a jerk he was and how selfish he was and, and how his decisions were affecting me. I was raised by a single mom. I've shared this with you guys before. Um, my childhood was populated with abusive and unsafe men. And so I brought into our marriage this idea that men were not safe and that I needed to be able to survive on my own. This created obviously so this relational chasm in our marriage, gosh, that felt overwhelming and almost insurmountable at times. But if you would have asked me, I would have happily told you that John was my problem. Because in my mind, he was not pulling his weight. He was not leading. He was not loving. And the truth is, I cut his legs out any time he tried. Even if he tried to do something, I would regularly let him know, I do not need you. I am a strong, independent woman. I would let him know I could do everything by myself. And then, you guys, I would secretly resent him for not helping me. Like, the lunacy of it all now is laughable, but at the time, my marriage was being crushed under the weight of poor management. And these patterns, these, these are so common when in all of our relationships, when we are so aware of the issues, but we're just ill-equipped or we're unwilling to deal with them, and we lack the, the humility and the grace that's necessary to move forward in a healthy way, so instead, we distract, right? In our personal relationships, this is going to be the next big thing. Maybe it's, well, we're so dysfunctional, we should get engaged because that'll take the attention off of all of our issues. And then we're planning the marriage. And then after the marriage, it's like, well, this isn't what I thought it was. You're not who I thought you were. When in fact, they're exactly who you thought you were. You just chose to distract rather than to actually manage that effectively. So now we just distract some more. Well, it's going to be the new house. It's going to be the new car. It's going to be the new boat or the new fishing pole or, or the new shoes. It's going to be the baby. The baby's going to fix everything. It's going to be the new job. There's always the next thing. I've seen this time and time again where we just keep kicking the can down the lane, thinking, hoping, praying that this next thing is going to fix everything, and it never does. Why? Because these are all distractions. These are rooted in a suppressive form of relationship management. When the distractions prove to be as worthless as they always were, now we start coping. The irony here is that a lot of the coping that we go to will go back to the denial or the control, or this is where you get your standard issue addictions. Pornography is a really, really common addiction, and we're not just seeing this in men anymore, but women as well. Why? Because there's no intimacy in the marriage, and it provides, once again, a counterfeit form of intimacy. Um, alcohol, again, because it's legal and it's acceptable. These are the two most common ones that I see in marriage, but then we go into prescriptions. We don't even have to become crackheads 
And like that feels laughable, but it's really not because there's so many societally accepted ways to cope with the depravity of our relationships now, um, but they're not any healthier. They are just as, if not even more destructive because they are so widely accepted in our relationships. And so we have to become aware of these issues. These, these patterns are all entangled, right? All of the different unhealthy choices that we're making. We established in self-management that, that once again, denial does not make our emotions go away. Remember, I've said it to you several times that denying your emotions doesn't make them go away, it just enslaves you to them. When it comes to our relationships and the denial, it's the denial of the issues. And here's what I'll tell you about denying the issues in any relationship that you have. Again, whether this is your spouse, these are family members, this is at work, we'll just, we're just going to deny it, we're just going to avoid it. Listen, in any relationship that you have, denying the issue does not make it go away, but what it does is it subjects any relationship with unresolved issues to the issues, okay? Another way to say this is if you don't start managing the issues in your relationships, those issues will start managing your relationships. These, these issues um, now have governing rights. They are now determining the temperature, the atmosphere, the overall health of your relationship. And so this is just not an effective way to approach management. There's a great biblical illustration of this, and, and it really speaks to God's heart on it, right? This idea that, well, these people can be so close to me, and it's not me, it's not my fault. There's a story in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel chapter 3, and it tells the story of a priest named Eli. The Bible characterizes Eli as a good man. He loved God. He sought to serve him faithfully. He had these two sons. Their names were Phineas and Hophni, in case you need any baby names. But the Bible records them as being scoundrels. Listen, if the Bible calls you a scoundrel, you are a dirtbag. And it says that they were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord. Scripture tells us that they would regularly steal from the offering that would come into the church, seduce the women who served in the church, and that Eli knew about this, and he refused to discipline them. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, the Lord is speaking to Samuel, who is being trained up to replace Eli, and this is what the Lord says. He says, I've already told him, Eli, that I'm going to punish his family forever because his sons have spoken evil things against me or blasphemed me. Eli knew that they were doing this and he did not stop them. Could Eli have controlled everything that his sons did? No, of course not. Any more than we can control our own kids, our spouses, our friends, our family members. The goal here is not that we can control the behavior of everyone around us. But here's what you need to understand. The fact that Eli knew about these things and refused to deal with them spoke to his character. You cannot mandate the behavior of those around you, but how you respond to that will always be a reflection of your character and not theirs. We are all prone to all different types of unhealthy patterns in our own relationships because oftentimes, like I said earlier, they've been modeled for us or they're being celebrated all around us. Exposing them in our own lives is that first step towards unhealthy relationship management. And so this week, I need you to get in the nitty gritty of your relationships. Look at the areas where maybe there's some avoidance. Look at the areas where there's some control. It's rooted in some fear. Look at the areas where there's some suppression, where I'm refusing to take responsibility, not dealing, and now these issues are governing, are hijacking my relationships. You have to be willing to start there first. As we expose these, which is going to be necessary, now we're going to go back to some healthy management styles. In order to go back to healthy management, we're going to go back to that one word in the definition. What does it mean to manage? We talked about this over and over because this is so important. To manage does not mean to deny. It doesn't mean to control. It doesn't mean to suppress. To manage means to regulate. What does it mean to regulate? To regulate means to make adjustments 
according to a certain standard to ensure accuracy of operation. It's the same thing that we did with self-management. So now as we transition into relationship management and we're looking to regulate, we're looking to make some adjustments according to the standard, it begs the question, what do I want the standard for my relationships to be? I'm gonna take all the guesswork out of it for you. You're in a class on biblical emotional intelligence. The standard that we want for every single one of our relationships, the centrifugal force of every one of our relationships should be love, right? Everybody wants love to be the standard for their relationships. Nobody wants it to be obligation or duty, none of that. We want the standard to be love. But then it begs the question, well, what is love? We can look at some biblical attributes, right? We can read things in scripture like 1 Corinthians 13. And it says love is patient and kind. It's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs or demand its own way. It's not irritable. Romans 12 says that, that love hates what's wrong and it holds tightly to what's good. Ephesians 4 says that love is humility and it's gentleness and it's forgiveness. 1 Thessalonians 5 says that love is encouragement and edification or building up. John 14 and 15 say that love is, is sacrifice and hard work. These are just a few of the many attributes that we see clearly laid out for us in the scripture, but none of them could stand alone and adequately encompass all that love is. But there's one definition that does, one definition that encompasses every single one of these attributes and so many more, and we find this in 1 John chapter 4. We're going to start in verses 7 through 8, but we're going to unpack a lot of 1 John chapter 4. It's so good. But let me start here. Let me read it to you guys. It says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God. Here it is, for God is love. If love is the standard, what is love? God is love. If the biblical standard of measurement for my life is God, God is love. God is that standard. So God is the standard for all my relationships. Like, okay, angel, I hear you, but what does that mean as it relates to navigating and interacting in my relationships? The short answer is everything, because this, this truth, this standard, literally changes even the way that we tend to approach our relationships. Because here's, here is a fun fact for you. Without intentionality, most relationships are both established and sustained through deficit-based dynamics, which basically just means that they satisfy our lack. We will naturally seek out relationships with people who are strong where we are weak. Not necessarily in every area, but in enough areas or in a big enough area to satisfy an integral need within us. Um, Oftentimes, this, this is kind of a subconscious pursuit, meaning that you're not consciously aware that, oh, I am weak, so I need this. And, and so it's this subconscious thing that's under the surface, and it's camouflaged by attraction. And so you're attracted to some people, um, and there could be a myriad of reasons that is motivating the attraction. But again, under the surface, there is this subconscious desire to satisfy a need within you. And because of this, we end up in close relationships with people who are characterized as our compatible opposites, okay? That can sound a little cold and transactional because it's like, so we just are all using each other? <laughs> Kind of, but not entirely. The biblical account of creation actually provides credible context for, 
for this interdependence in a healthy and life-giving way. In Genesis chapter 2, it's recorded that as God looked on his creation of Adam, he declared that it was not good for him to be alone. It was not good for him to be alone. The fact that he needed a suitable helpmate, those are God's words, you need a suitable helpmate, one that would satisfy his lack, one that would be different but the same. Equal in value, but unique in form and function. I think so often we as Christians have, have this, this ability to over-spiritualize our relationships at times with this idea that I can't need anyone else because if I do, then, then somehow I'm not trusting God. Listen, that's just not true. We need each other. God's the one who said it first. He looked at man, said, this is not good for you to be alone. You need a suitable helpmate. So this is not true. We have to first expose this fallacy. The problem is not that we need each other or even that our relationships satisfy needs in our lives. When we go wrong it is when we view the relationship as our source rather than a vessel. God has no problem using relationships as vessels, vessels of comfort, vessels of encouragement, vessels of companionship, of pleasure, or anything else within the boundaries that he has established to ensure accuracy of operation. With God as the standard for my relationships, my need for others is not null and void. But the interactions, every interaction, takes on a deeper meaning. Because this standard revolutionizes the way that I understand my relationships because I no longer approach them with, with my deficits or my lack with the expectation of this Jerry Maguire moment. Could you be the one to complete me? Are you my soulmate? No! Let me just tell you a thousand times over, no! But this is where we've missed it in relationship management because we're asking the wrong question. The question that I should be asking of every single relationship in my life is not, do you complete me? Are you my soulmate? The question we should be asking is, God, how do you want to use me in this person's life? Or God, how are you trying to use this person in my life? From the most intimate exchanges to those that are limited to a single interaction, from your best friends to the cashier at the grocery store, every single relationship and every single interaction should be framed with God. How do you want to use me? God, how can I be a vessel? And this is what it means to manage my relationships with God as the standard. It's possible that I'm projecting the whole Jerry Maguire thing onto you guys because that was very much my story. But I've been a clinician long enough to know that we do this all the time. And for me, I know it was true. John was everything I ever wanted he was the standard from the time that I met him. Everyone else was measured up against him. And so I know without a shadow of a doubt when I married him, I fully expected him to complete me. He was my soulmate. He was going to make me feel loved and confident and secure and satisfy all of those insecurities that I'd had all of my life. It, it's sad because I can look back now at those first couple years of my marriage and now I, I realize there was there were definitely periods of, of mourning and grieving over unmet expectations I didn't have that language then I just thought oh marriage is not what I thought it was going to be but but it was mourning it was grieving the loss of, of a position that I'd put this man in that he should have never been in he, he was never meant to be my source of life, my source of identity. But we do this in so many of our relationships. And for you, maybe it's not a spouse, but maybe it was a parent, it was a mentor, it could have even been a pastor or a friend. We put coaches and bosses and siblings 
It literally could be anybody in your life when you position these people to be a source, a source of identity, a source of security, rather than a vessel. You set this relationship up for dysfunction and failure every single time. But how do we go from this, this wildly dysfunctional place into a healthy place where our relationships are operating the way that God intended them to? And really, that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time today. And this is going to be the foundation that we build upon for every strategy that we employ in every relationship that we're a part of. Because if we want to move out of the dysfunction, if we want to move out of the denial and the suppression and the control, and we want to move out of these people being our sources, we've got to establish some foundational truths that can redirect our heart. Because here's the truth of it, you guys. We're still going to slip back into these patterns. We are in such close-knit community with the other humans in our lives that sometimes these things creep in undetected. But now that you have an awareness, once you recognize them, these foundational truths that I'm about to lay out for you will redirect your heart back to healthy relationship management. So here we go. The type of relationship management I'm proposing, which to be clear, is going to be worth every ounce of blood, sweat, or tears that it may require is going to be so much easier if you have this rubric to operate from. So these three truths, these governing principles, once again, are taken from 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 16 through 19 for you, then I'm going to give you these truths. We're going to unpack them for a minute, and then we'll be done for today. But 1 John chapter 4 verse 16 says this, And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. Remember, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. There's so much there. But listen, when God is the standard for my, my relationships, three truths are evident. Number one, God, excuse me, love is reliable. Love is reliable. Number two, my capacity to give love hinges on my ability to receive love. My capacity to give love hinges on my ability to receive love. And number three, I don't give or receive love because I'm good. I do so because he's good. Let's unpack these. Number one, truth number one, love is reliable. Despite what your experiences may have told you or will try to tell you in the future, love is reliable. So many of you listening right now, I know you've gone through so many hard times, so many hard relationships, but no matter how badly you've been hurt, betrayed, abused, rejected, abandoned, love is reliable. No matter what culture tries to mandate or trends try to dictate, love is reliable. Love does not evolve. It is not evolving. Love existed before the foundation of the earth, and it was perfect and complete before you ever took your first breath. The only time that love is unreliable is when we try to redefine it. The Bible qualifies the reliability of love through the credibility of how it's defined. God is love. Verse 16, let me read it again. We know and rely on the love God has for us because God is love. The reason we can rely on love is because of how his word defines love. God is love. Are you tired of me saying it yet? This has to become the first and foremost foundational truth because maintaining a fixed definition of love is integral to maintaining healthy relationship management. The problem in so many of our relationships is the fluid nature of how love is defined. And this is not going to be uncommon to you because we've all heard things like love is a feeling. No, love is a choice. 
Love is passion. Love is attraction. Love is heterosexual. Love is homosexual. Love is asexual. Love is what I can get from you. Love is what I can give. Love is this. Love is that. Stop it. Love is not any of that. The moment we change the definition of love, we change the standard. And changing the standard is so dangerous because it compromises the reliability. Let me say it another way. The only way, the only time that love ever becomes unreliable is when you change the definition of love. God is love. And when we live in love, we live in God. God is constant and never changing. The Bible says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he's the beginning and the end and everything in between. You guys, he is everything that you need in the very moment that you need it. He's never late. He's never early. He's never absent. The problem is not that God is ever unreliable. The problem is that we lack the discipline to live in God. Remember, you were made by him and for him. When you're made for something, you'll never be satisfied without it. The moment that you change the definition of love to satisfy your flesh, you move out of the love that you were created for, and it will never, never satisfy you. Love like that is unreliable, and it's evident in the world around us. We keep changing the definition of love to satisfy the desires of our flesh. And all I have to do is ask you, do you feel like people feel more loved or less loved? Does our world feel populated with more love and security or with less? We keep changing the standard on this false hope that it's going to somehow become more inclusive. It's a lie. It's so deceptive, and it will never satisfy us. So if you ever find yourself in a place where you feel like love is unreliable, I want you to ask yourself one question. How have I redefined love? So number one, truth, foundational truth, number one, love is reliable. Number two, my capacity to give love hinges on my ability to receive love, receive love. See, we live in a fallen, broken world full of hurting people, and we're all trying to figure out ways to get our needs met. This provides a plethora of opportunities for us to be abused and rejected and abandoned and betrayed. And all of those experiences, whether individually or cumulatively, have formed these scars over our heart that just build up over time. They, they dam up over time. And the problem is, is that... Those, those scars have a way of keeping pain in and love out, okay? But in order to move forward in healthy, life-giving, love-filled relationship management, you guys, we have to learn to let love in. And only when we do this can we begin to, to live from love and not for love. 1 John 4.19 in the message translation, I love how it reads. It says this. It says, we, though, we're going to love. We're going to love and be loved. First, we were loved. Now we loved. But he loved us first. Over and over, this message is that we were first loved. First, we were loved. There, there's a whole mess of freedom right there just begging for you to pick it up. But what this communicates is that regardless of how badly the people in my life, whether that's presently or historically, have treated me, no matter how bad they suck, I am so completely and wholly worthy of love in this moment. Effective management of our relationships it is predicated upon this truth that the love that I need that, that my soul craves is available to me right now. No strings attached, no conditions, and I have to receive that love first. If I'm going to move forward in healthy relationships, it's not so that I can achieve love. It's so because I'm already living from that love. Management brings order. We've talked about this so many times. But order as it pertains to our relationships, 
states that wherever I am with God will determine how I am with others. Let me say that again because you need to understand the power and the work of the cross. Where I am with God determines how I am with others. Adam communed with God before he ever communed with Eve. The compromise happens not because we are, are, again, all malicious and lustful creatures being drawn away by every desire of our flesh. How do those things even creep in? Because we stop communing with God. And the moment I stop communing here, I start compromising here. And here's why. Because when I stop communing here and I no longer have a God, now the people in my life who were designed to be vessels, now they become idols. And, and so now I'm, I'm compromising in, in every single one of these relationships because I'm worshiping them rather than just allowing them to be supplemental vessels of love, encouragement, pleasure, delight, whatever that is. Now I'm relying on them. I'm worshiping them. And we begin to see the disorder in our lives. So let me say it again. Where you are with God determines how you are with others. God is love. His love is holy and fully available to you right now. And the only thing that will satisfy the deepest desires of your souls. But if you don't receive that love first and you go out trying to navigate all these relationships in a healthy way, you will fall flat on your face every single time because they're no longer operating as vessels. They're operating as idols. So we have to be able to recognize that. If you find yourself in a position where you feel like you're striving you're hungry for attention, you're thirsty for love, which in turn is stifling your ability to love others, let this truth redirect you. Where am I with God? If you don't, your desperation for love will always lead you to compromises. It's not weak or clingy, or any other negative word you can think of to need love, to desire love. It's the number one need of every human being. You were created. The Bible says that you were made by him for him, but if he is love, you were made by love for love. So it's not needy or unhealthy to need that, but you have to recognize where that true source and vessel comes from so that we can live for love and not from love. And finally, truth number three, I don't give or receive love because I'm good. I do so because he's good. This is not the part of the class where I tell you how unworthy you are. Rarely do we need those reminders, right? This is the part where I tell you, though, and this is such a good reminder for all of us, is that you're never going to be good enough not to need God right? Your relationships are never going to be healthy enough not to need God. You're never going to get to a place where you're like, okay, God, we'll take it from here. So often my pride puts words in my mouth that are just flat out lies where I, I, I am doing good and I am communing here and God and I are good and the relational intimacy is overflowing and it's the subtlest a foothold of the enemy that comes in and suddenly we're not communing. And before I realize that I'm not good, but I don't want anybody else to know that because I don't even realize fully that I'm not good. And then my husband comes and he's like, hey, babe, you good? Oh yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Close friends around me are asking, hey, you seem off. Are you good? No, I'm good. I'm good. You're never going to be good enough not to need God. There's, there's no level of health or, or relational integrity that you're ever going to achieve where you're going to be able to let God know, hey, we'll take it from here. This ongoing dependence on him is a sign of spiritual health and emotional maturity. 1 John 4, 17 and 18, again, the message translation, it goes on to describe what life is like when we're not hell-bent on being good on our own. It's the life that I want. It's the life that I'm learning to protect. But it says this, God is love. And when we take up a permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house. It becomes at home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on judgment day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. I've taken up a residence 
in a life of love. And the seal of the Holy Spirit says that I can never be evicted, but I can, I can choose to move out but I'll never be kicked out. As long as I don't move out, his love has a chance to become mature and fully formed in me. And fully formed love will always work on me and flow through me. But you guys, when we try to become good, when we try to become good on our own, good enough for God, good enough for others, good enough with others, we've moved out of love. We've changed the standard. The scripture tells us if we would just protect our connection to the Father, that our standing and our reputation is identical to Christ, meaning that if we would get rid of all the effort that we're putting into just being good enough to simply being with the one who is good, these other things would all take care of themselves. And listen, not over once, but over time, because as we live in God, his love matures in us. And as his love matures in us, it's so much easier to manage healthy relationships. And so again, these, these, these foundational truths are going to provide the framework but we have to get them in our spirit before we start trying to execute strategies of, of healthy relationship management. And so this week, I need you to be brutally honest. I need you to be brutally honest with, with how you approach your relationships. I need you to be brutally honest with those people that you've placed in the position of idols. I need you to be brutally honest with the level of control and denial and suppression that's at work in your relationship, and not for the purpose of shaming or condemning you, but for the purpose of moving towards life-giving, God-loving relationships that will satisfy you, that will glorify God, and that will testify to the world around you that God is love. So take that challenge seriously and employ these principles this week. We'll come back and finish up next week with some strategies on how to live this out in a practical way. I'll see you then. Here at Dream City Omaha, we're all about helping people discover Christ, recover identity, and uncover purpose. Please explore our past videos, sermon series, and online classes. And don't forget, to like and subscribe for more.